Uh, I guess we can get started. We got lots of people here. And I wanted to thank everybody for their patience as I <clears throat> take this on and deal with my issues. Um, and uh, everybody for chipping in and doing what you need to do, even though I might not have said anything. So we're here to do sprints reviews for 108 and 109. Um, we have a new team, Scout. Um, they're gonna be presenting later and they're um, working on export functions. And everybody updated everything. So I guess we, we just skipped to, to the demos, right? Is the idea here? Yeah. Um, okay, yes. And then sometimes Jakob will have something to say. Uh, Jakob said he didn't have anything to say, but. Okay. And, and all of us who um, do these updates on the, on the, what we did the last uh, four weeks and what we're going to do the next uh, couple sprints, um, hopefully folks are reading that every once in a while, because I think um, I, I tend to learn a lot from the other teams and it doesn't all get presented here. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty dense in there. There's a lot going on. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely coming from, I come from that implementer side and I've always kind of, um, you know, that's what's been my focus until more, my bigger focus until more recently. And I hadn't really delved into the detail that was available in these slides, but I think that's a good thing that maybe a, I can bring up to implementers too, because they always want to know what's coming up and it's like, well, it's in here. So I think, um, I will take a moment sometime in the next sprint or two to bring those over to the implementers group so they can see this as well. So, so we start with um, Firebird. And I will stop sharing my screen. Sounds good. Um, so as with the last few sprint reviews, uh, Firebird has been working diligently at the remote storage domatic thin thread feature. Um, which is in line to make the release uh, deadlines this week, and we are very excited about it. Um, today, uh, Slava will be showing us uh, some of the workflows. Um, so we'll be doing um, the, he'll show us the accession workflow and then also uh, retrieving an item uh, from remote storage. Uh, so did I miss anything, Slava? Uh... Yeah, okay. Steph, thank you for your sure. uh, intro. Uh, I share my screen. Guys, could you please confirm that you can see my screen? Looks yes. good. Okay, so uh, last time we worked on a new feature for uh, this is integration with uh, remote storage. Uh, we start with Gematic. Uh, uh, EMS integration and um, uh, have already implemented all the flows, but today I'm going to present you uh, both of these flows, namely access accession and uh, retrieval flow. Uh, so that uh, uh, contains two modules, uh, one for, uh, for business uh, processes and uh, second module for integration for API uh, for uh, storages. So, okay, uh, let's start from a session flow and uh, I'll present how this feature works. Okay, uh, uh, let's imagine that uh, we need to move some of our items to a remote storage. What we can do, uh, we need to go to the inventory and uh, choose uh, some items that are not located in remote storage, but in uh, some uh, folio locations. Uh, for example, uh, let's choose uh, main library location and uh, American Bar Association uh, Journal. We can see uh, that we have some several items uh, that are located in the main library. And uh, now let's try to move uh, these items in the remote 
uh, storage. Uh, uh, for this purposes, we need to change effective location of this item. We can do this in the following manner. Let's choose, for example, temporary location, some remote temporary location, and uh, so our changes. Okay, uh, we can do this as well for another item. For example, this one. Saving our changes. And uh, now uh, let's see what happens on folio side. Can uh, retrieve our accessions. And uh, we can see that the corresponding record were created. And uh, pay your attention that uh, on folio side, this record aren't accession accessioned yet because uh, there is no accession date time in this records. Now uh, let's switch to a thematic side. Uh, we can make a call to uh, folio edge host and see that uh, thematic AMS uh, retrieving uh, both of these records. After that, we can uh, move back to our accessions queue and uh, uh, we can see that accession date time was created. Okay, if we make as a call to our API, HPI, we can see that uh, uh, no available items for uh, accession uh, for thematic EMS. Uh, uh, this uh, was accession flow uh, for remote storage feature. And uh, now uh, let's see a uh, retrieving flow. Uh, we can choose, for example, some item that is checked out. Let it be not. Uh, we can see that uh, this is a checked out item and uh, we can choose its barcode and uh, try to make call from thematic site. Just changing this item. Good. Okay. A request uh, successfully completed and now return back to follow. Let's verify that our item is available now. Okay, uh, we can see that status of our item was changed to available. So uh, this was uh, two workflows for current uh, integration with thematic AMS that uh, Firebird team presented you today. Thank you for your time. Slava or stuff, um, that, that first um, where the, the accession date and time changed, would that be kind of the equivalent, the material has gotten to remote storage and now the remote storage people are um, scanning it to say, yes, we have it now and we're gonna put it away, is that? Is that what that means, the date and time, the accession date and time? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, or anybody that uses Domatic on the call, I don't know if there is anybody. So I changing the location of the item uh, is what triggers the accession process. So it still has to go through making it to remote storage and being accepted there. Um, okay. So yeah, that would make sense. It uh, You change the location, it hops on a truck, it goes out in the wilderness somewhere to where the remote storage is. Mm -hmm. And then somebody says, yes, I got it. And then that's what triggers the accession date and time. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Thank you, Slava.
Thank you. I stop sharing my screen. I did forget to mention at the beginning here was that we do have eight presentations, so we're going to have to stick on the 10 minutes. Of course, you guys did a good job, so we're well in line. Uh, Kalila and Spitfire. Hey, everybody. Hey, Kelly. So uh, my actually pretty timely that we're going after Firebird because my team, Spitfire, uh, now is responsible for the quick mark modules that they, uh, they originally developed. So Dennis will present uh, some of the work we've done uh, uh, really to quick mark, including the, the we've enhanced the uh, or improved the, the user experience as far as deleting fields when you edit a quick mark record. Um, in addition, um, we have uh, implemented the functionality that allows a user to derive a new mark bibliographic record and also a new inventory instance record. With eHoldings, because we still own the eHoldings app, uh, we have uh, implemented uh, shortcut keys. So Dennis, take it away. Yep. Thank you, Halila. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, that should be this one, I think. <clears throat> so please tell me when you can see it. We can see it, Dennis. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. So um, as Kalila said, we have done some work uh, in QuickMark uh, and uh, inventory modules. So first thing I'm going to show you is um, this new um, derive new MarkBib record functionality. So you can see that uh, I here have opened a uh, inventory record with a source type Mark. <clears throat> And we have added a new option, this menu, uh, derive a new mark bibliographic records. So what this will do, it's um, going to create a new mark record and a new uh, inventory um, item inventory record based on existing uh, mark records. So uh, as uh, you can see for this, this example, all uh, Almost all fields from the original mark records uh, are the same, um, for, uh, uh, but uh, for 001 and 005 and uh, 9 and uh, FF fields, which uh, will be uh, populated when uh, this mark record is created. Uh, but uh, any other fields, uh, you can edit them and uh, uh, yeah, as as you like. So the original mark record is uh, act le like acts as a template for the new one. Um, and um, another field uh, which are uh, which content uh, is removed is uh, 035 and uh, 019. But I think we don't have uh, a 019 field in this record. Yeah. So. Um, let me change um, something like uh, maybe demo duplicate um, to see that uh, we have uh, edited this uh, mark record and save it. Um, so regarding saving and um, how it's processed, uh, so currently uh, there might be a bit of a delay between you save the record and um, it's actually created. So that's, uh, I think, um, uh, similar to how that import process it, it's it. So there may be a bit of a delay. And for this sprint, we have planned uh, on UI to better um, uh, handle this uh, delays. So, um, okay, so now you see a message has appeared uh, uh, saying that this record has successfully saved uh, and changes, uh, it may take some time to uh, see the changes. So, um, as I said, it may take some time to create a new record. So now I'm going to show you um, something else in the uh, mark, uh, quick mark module. Um, so I'm going to show you the delete functionality. Let's uh, switch maybe to another record, maybe this one. Mm. Seems like something is missing for this record. Okay, yeah. 
Um, so let's go to edit in quick mark. Um, and uh, so previously, when you wanted to delete uh, a few fields in a quick mark record, you had to confirm uh, deletion per field. Uh, but we have changed it so that uh, these deletions uh, have to be confirmed uh, like only when you save it. So uh, for example, if I uh, mark this field to delete and this one, and save, uh, hit save and close, uh, you will see this confirmation model saying that uh, if like, are you sure you want to delete these two fields? Um, if you click save, then they'll be deleted and the record will be uh, updated. If you click cancel, then uh, those fields will be restored. Um, and uh, other like small uh, note is that if I, for example, make uh, changes to some other field, and I delete another one. Uh, if I hit save and close and cancel, uh, this edit is uh, still present, but uh, also this field is restored. So um, only um, on the changes that are canceled is uh, the uh, deleted fields. Um, so let me go back to um, the inventory items and see if uh, uh, we have created a new record. Mm. Seems like not yet. So I think uh, we can um, return to it uh, a little bit later. So I think now I'll switch to a holdings module and demo uh, what we have done uh, in terms of shortcuts. So for shortcuts, uh, we have uh, implemented a few of them. So the first one is um, creating a new title or package uh, item. You can do that by uh, pressing Alt N and that takes you to titles uh, new page or if you're on packages list uh, alt n and text it to package new no, new package uh, page um, okay so the other ones are if you're for example on a, uh, a page and you want to either collapse or expand all accordions you can do that by clicking um, i think that's a default uh, uh, one so uh, control alt g to collapse all accordions and control alt b to expand all accordions um, and uh, the other one is um, editing uh, records you can do that by pressing control alt e and that takes you to uh, edit record page um, and uh, you can save uh, uh, your edits. So let's change access status type to cancellation and uh, hit control S. And that will save this uh, these edits. Um, and I think uh, uh, that's probably, oh, there's another one, um, um, a shortcut to go to a search and filter page. So that should be control uh, alt H. Mm, which for some reason doesn't seem to work now. Okay, well, I think we'll <laughs> we'll have to take a look at it uh, a bit later. Um, yeah, let's reload this uh, inventory module again, see if we have uh, a new record. Uh, doesn't seem to have been created yet, but... Um, isn't yeah, that what's showing in the left-hand screen? It says instance record derived. Um, that should be uh, that should be demo derived from Ezekiel. Ah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, as I said, it may take some time. I don't know why. Uh, maybe um, our environment is a bit more loaded than usual for now. But yeah, it should uh, so create uh, a new mark record uh, based on the original one, and uh, create a new inventory. Um, item with that new mark record uh, with the edits that uh, I have uh, done. So it's probably yeah, bit, taken a bit uh, too long than usual. So, so, just, yeah. oh, sorry, Dennis. So yeah, we we found that it, it may take some time for that inventory record to be created. So we're working in our current sprint to provide messaging um, to indicate that it's going to take some time. 
Um, right now, we, it, you know, we're, it may take upwards of 20 seconds for it to actually, actually display a record. Um, so, um, and that's just because we're, we are relying on a, uh, it's tied to kind of data import and using an import related to data import. So it may take some time for it to display. And right now we're just working on messaging to, uh, to indicate that to the user. Can I just ask a quick question is why you choose derived versus duplicate? Um, that's a great question, Kelly. Uh, in talking with the QuickMark uh, subgroup team, uh, me, uh, folks, uh, they preferred that language. That language is, uh, is something familiar to, uh, to the people in the subgroup uh, based on the use of OCLC. Uh, duplicate for them wasn't very clear. It didn't make much sense to them and they preferred that language. Thank you, yeah. Jessica. Yeah, that's a really good point. And OCLC calls it derived because you don't want to have duplicate records. That's bad in cataloging, but you want to derive and save as much typing as you can. Okay. Well, we might want to consider that other places too, because it's sort of the same duplicate slash derived process, but thanks. This is awesome. Okay, thank you. Um... So I think I'll uh, stop sharing my screen now. So the record is not uh, appearing and I don't want to take uh, much more time. So um, thank you everyone. Hopefully following the chat discussion, there's a lot of good information also and in discussion going on over there. Um, and next we have Scout, which is our new team and Deborah Howell from Cornell is here to introduce them. Good morning. Um, so uh, Scout is a, a, a temporary team to do two subsets of larger UX prods uh, that were preventing Cornell from being able to go live on July 1. So um, one of the, the subsets is transferring fees and fines to the Cornell bursar system. And the other one is the circ log export to CSV for us. And with that, I will turn it over to Makita, Alexi, and Roman. Uh, yes, yes. Hello. I think that uh, that Makita will be be making demo for today. Day because for today my internet connection is it's is rather bad and, and I can be be lost anytime. Time, Nikita, please. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Thank you, Deborah and Alicia. Um, could you please uh, let me know that uh, you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, see. we can. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, and uh, before we start, I'd like to note uh, that uh, uh, our boss uh, expert uh, implement new data expert approach that was implemented by uh, Vasily, and uh, it was uh, uh, it works asynchronously. Uh, and actually, uh, any other uh, new data experts, uh, for example, for finance or any other models, uh, can can be implemented uh, based on this new data expert approach. Uh, and uh, together with it, uh, it supports uh, two two ways uh, to work uh, by schedule and uh, manually. And uh, I'll demonstrate this. Uh, for Bursar, um, Bursar example. So uh, first of all, I start from new model that is called Textport Manager. And uh, here we can see our standard uh, three-plane layout that uh, displays uh, all export jobs. Uh, and currently we support uh, uh, two types, Bursar and uh, circulation log. And uh, we can filter by type, uh, by status of uh, job execution, um, source of uh, uh, like action, uh, was it done by user or by system, um, start time of the job and end time. Uh, and uh, of course, search as usually we have on other screens. And uh, additionally, we have a detailed pane where we can see additional information 
like uh, error details in case uh, job is failed. Uh, it can provide uh, it provides information to the end user what's wrong with the job uh, and so on. And uh, from the screen, uh, user can download exports. For example, we have uh, one successful uh, job for Bursar and uh, by clicking on uh, on the name, uh, all two files uh, are downloaded. For Bursar uh, format, uh, uh, there are two export files and uh, special uh, .da2 extension. Uh, and uh, the same can be done from uh, from the details view and the job ID column. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's move to settings. Uh, I'd like to show how we can uh, configure schedule for Bursar. Uh, under tenant in general, we have new option Bursar experts. Uh, where we can define schedule period. It can be none, hours, days, uh, and weeks. Um, none is by default, but currently it's configured hourly. And uh, there is additional uh, schedule frequency fields that describes that uh, job will be uh, job will be executed uh, to um, one time per two hours. Uh, in case we change to days, uh, we have additional field like schedule time. It means that uh, job will be executed at specific time. For example, I want to execute at uh, um, 18, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, every two days. And uh, in case we select uh, weeks, uh, we can set up days uh, when job is executed. Uh, and tell back to uh, hours and to show an example with uh, how like, that it can be saved. Uh, and additionally, here we can define folder uh, for S3 bucket uh, to save our experts and uh, additional job parameters, uh, days outstanding and uh, pattern groups uh, to do our export. Uh, and in case uh, job is failed uh, uh, by schedule or uh, user want to execute it right now, we have a button done manually. Uh, and uh, when it's completed, we see a message that uh, job is scheduled. And we can go to uh, to export manager and see that uh, we have new record here with uh, scheduled status. Uh, and yeah, now it's in progress. Um, maybe in time it will give it will it will be completed, but uh, to, to not waste time, uh, I think uh, we can skip this and. Uh, uh, finish our part. Yeah, that's it for me, thank you. Is that scheduler um, a shared component or could it maybe become a shared component if, if other apps might need it? Um, uh, yes, uh, it will we... become a, we'll be, we have a meeting this week actually to start talking about turning this over to the, to the larger UX pods that these were split off from. Okay, thank you. Oh, we can we can run export jobs of any of any type by this this schedule. Yes. Okay, good. It was a nice little UI for for scheduling. And I assume the circulation log works the same way. Circulation um, for circulation, uh, we have only one button like export, uh, and that's it. Oh, okay, uh, right. yeah, there is no schedule for circulation work. All right, well, thank you. That's a nice addition. Um, next is Vega and Darcy, unless anybody else has any other questions. All right. Hey, hello there. Um, so we're going to demo demonstrate um, overrides and to give a little context, um, the overrides are to override specifically patron blocks as well as item level errors or blocks, um, such as a non loanable item due to the loan policy. Um, patron blocks, the type of patron blocks that exist are things like 
too many um, items checked out, too many items overdue, maybe your fee fine balance is too high. Um, and we look at these in the context of the checkout process, requests, and renewals. So Anna is going to start with the checkout, and then Roman will follow with requests, and Dimitri will do renewals. Thanks, Darcy. Yep. I share on my screen. Can you see it? Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. I will dem demo uh, overriding process when we borrowing items. Uh, during uh, implementation, we migrated from two APIs to the single one and now checking out and um, overriding occurring on the single checkout by barcode endpoint. At the beginning, I will show a writing of item blocks. I already set it up all settings. <clears throat> uh, so let's try to check out um, not loanable item. Uh, we see this error that uh, item is not loanable and um, current user has uh, specific uh, permissions and uh, we can see the pattern of right. So without permissions, uh, this button uh, will be uh, hidden. Let's overwrite. We should uh, put date, time, and um, some comment. And now we successfully check it out the item. And uh, the second uh, item block is item limit. Let's um, try to check out item with limit. Uh, we successfully check it out first one. Here we can see the policy limit of one. So let's try to check out second one. And here we can see uh, the error that pattern has reached maximum limit uh, and we can override this error. Um, and now we successfully check it out the second, um, uh, the second item, and here we can see the label. This that item limit uh, was overridden. Um, and now let's try to override pattern blocks. Let's found block it pattern. And here we can see that the current pattern is blocked from borrowing, but we can overwrite this block. Uh, we should put some command. Save and close. And now we can um, try to check out any item. And here we can see that we check it out uh, the item for blocked uh, pattern. And now let's uh, see how a <coughs> work combination of blocks. So let's try to check out not loanable item. And again, uh, appears the model, right? And here we should set the date, time, and we can see also uh, the comment from the previous model. And here we can extend it with um, some extra info. Save and close, and we successfully override it. And let's try to override uh, item with limit. First one will successfully check it out, the first um, item. And let's try to borrow the second one. So error message we can see again, right? Here the same um, first one comment. We can extend it with uh, comment two and we successfully override it. Um, item limit. 
and again, again we can see the label. Also, our application is uh, remembering that we already write it pattern block. We can successfully go to other pages and uh, we still, uh, application still remember that uh, the block um, was overridden. We can proceed to check it out. Um, and uh, it will be remembered during the session. Now we end the session. And if, you try, if we try to check out uh, in new items, uh, we should overwrite the pattern block again. And that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. I stop sharing my screen. Uh, I have a question. Yes. I think the first one you did was not loanable and then you overrode it and then it got checked out. But what loan rule did it use if it, if it was non-loanable? Does um, it use a specific policy? That's why you get prompted to, add, to um, set the, the due date. Yes. I thought uh, the first one, she didn't, uh, it didn't prompt. Yes, yes, uh, I have, um, I understand your question. I have three types of um, items. Uh, um, simple was, uh, simple without any blocks, the first one. Um, I will show again. Um, well, not this page. <laughs> Uh, the first one was, uh, I was working with three type of items. It was um, the book. Uh, it has a policy one hour. And the second type, um, that's uh, settings I was prepared before. That's not loanable. Oh, and then it does get, you do pick out the date. Uh, yes, uh, we can see different policies. Uh, not loanable for this uh, item. This is DVD material <laughs> type. One hour, it's uh, this type um, doesn't have any item blocks. Right. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, Roman, are you ready to do yours? Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm sharing my screen. Yep, can we you can see it yep. now. Oh, yep. great. Well, uh, the other override feature that I'd like to show is uh, request overriding. I already configured the limit for for the pattern group of my user, and only only request uh, will be blocked automatically after reaching the limit. Uh, let's go to the users. Um, I've already, I already uh, made a block for, uh, for my test user. Uh, I checked out two items uh, and there are no open requests for this user. Now let's try to request something. We can see a error message uh, that pattern has uh, charged out the maximum number of items. Uh, there is a bottom override. Uh, if the user didn't have permissions for overriding, we wouldn't see this button. Uh, since we see the button override, it means that user uh, has permissions and request can be overridden. I'll click override, then sa save and close. And the request has been just performed. Uh, let's check it in uh, users. 
requests. Uh, there is one open request uh, despite uh, the existing uh, pattern block. That's all about this feature. Thanks. That's great, Roman, thanks. And just an FYI, there is no existing sort of general comment field on the request. And that's why we're not adding a comment at this time, but that'll be future development. Um, Dimitri, would you like to go next on renewals? Dimitri, are you on and maybe, oh, okay. Maybe you're on mute. Yes, I already start sharing my screen. Great, we can see it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we uh, can uh, renew from several places. Uh, the first place that I want to show you uh, can be on the, our list. We select several items, we click our renew button. Uh, how you can see, we have a pattern block model. Uh, our right button will be displayed only if uh, current user have no necessary permission. I click on it. I add comment. I save my changes. Uh, how you can see, we successfully override a line item and we have uh, several errors for others. Uh, not override. We also can uh, renew from our action menu. I click our right button. I click on save and close. And how you can see it's scheduled our right uh, one. Also, we can renew from the long details. I also click over right. I enter my message. I click on save and close button. Uh, how you can see, we successfully uh, overwrite our renewal from three places. And uh, in all cases, we have a correct uh, action that we renew from overwrite. Uh, that's all. Do you have any other questions? Thanks, Dimitri. Sorry, Kelly, if we went a little over. Okay, good stuff. I think we got a few extra minutes. So uh, Anne-Marie and Foley Jet. All right, and I'll beg forgiveness because we may take a couple extra minutes too. Um, and whenever I see the Cirque stuff, I remember why I'm glad I'm not a Cirque person. Um, so we're going to show two things from Folajet today. The first one, Alexi is going to show something that kind of builds on what Thor, the index data guys, showed last time for the single record import. And then um, Ruslan and I are going to show what we've been working on pretty much the whole development time for Iris, which is the invoicing uh, import. So Alexi. Yeah, hello everyone. So let me uh, share my screen. Uh, okay, do you see it? Yep. Nice. So uh, as Anne Marie mentioned uh, before on previous uh, uh, follow demo, you uh, 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 um, Index data folks present a new functionality uh, related to import um, um, mark records and creating uh, um, uh, inventory instances uh, from external uh, sources. Uh, and uh, Folger team uh, from uh, our site uh, in uh, some way extend and uh, functionality for login and uh, fix several bugs. So um, let me share uh, how it uh, works and how we can uh, view logs for such kinds of imports. 
So let's uh, start with importing a new record. Um, uh, you can, uh, after the import uh, in, in um, inventory uh, application, you can go to data import application. And uh, as you see, as there are no any uh, log records related to single record import, it, uh, but you can find it in view all uh, uh, screen. Uh, it, uh, was made for, uh, um, let's say, uh, hide uh, a lot of uh, possible uh, journal uh, records from logs, because uh, it can be uh, a, a pretty big amount of such operation can be performed. Uh, and as you see, we have um, uh, on the top of this list, uh, uh, a record in our uh, log uh, spreadsheet. Uh, we have um, uh, no file name label for such kind of imports because uh, there are no, uh, let's say, uploaded files uh, uh, like uh, in uh, basic data import. Uh, and uh, we have a um, uh, job profile name uh, that uh, describes um, uh, this uh, kind of import. So it's a default create instance. Uh, by clicking on uh, this uh, um, record, you can see a um, list of uh, records uh, that uh, were, uh, let's say, uh, created. And in this case, we have one record and several operations like uh, SRS mark beep was created and instance also was created. And by clicking here, you can uh, find all um, information about this mark record in JSON format and uh, the instance uh, uh, entity in JSON format also. Uh, but uh, also it works uh, this in same way for um, uh, for update action because uh, um, you can uh, in some way uh, import the wrong file and uh, uh, you want to overwrite it. So uh, you can find your uh, record, perform overlay action with uh, another one or CLC number. Uh, and uh, going back to data import application, Go to the view all tab, and uh, we can see that we have a journal record with uh, update instance profile. It have a completed status. Uh, so uh, let's go back to in inventory uh, application and try to find uh, updated record by a new uh, identifier. That's it. So we have the same uh, human readable ID, but uh, we overlay uh, the uh, previously imported uh, mark record at instance by U1. And uh, also we have all information in our logs. So I think uh, briefly that's it from my side. Uh, any questions? Okay, so I'm stop sharing. All right, thanks, Alexi. So yeah, that was definitely collaboration from index data for the work that happened in inventory and communicating with the external sources. And remember last time they also showed um, going out to Library of Congress and then the data import is the profiles that are used for the importing and then the, the logging that you saw. So our big feature that we've been working on in IRIS has been importing Edifact invoices. Um, and can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, with the invoices, um, I'm, I'm not gonna show you a lot cause I'm gonna mostly save the time for Ruslan, but 
Um, one of the things that we are gonna be um, uh, making available in IRIS is some default field mapping profiles for the 12 vendors that were identified by uh, libraries as their vendors that they get out of fact invoices from. And we wanted to do this for a couple reasons. Um, the, the mapping from the Edifact fields is not as familiar for folks as the mark mapping is in the field mapping profiles. It's also a little bit more complicated. And so I'm working on a, a wiki page that, that uh, describes the, the structure for the syntax um, that will hopefully uh, help. But we also are kind of creating these stub profiles that folks can um, either update if, if you do use that vendor, delete if you don't use that vendor, um, duplicate if you need maybe a different um, import profile for E versus physical or for serials versus monographs. Um, and then once you've updated them, we won't change them again when, when you go through migration to Juniper. So we've created these stub profiles. None of them will work with the details that they have currently. You, you definitely have to add some local details. Um, your vendor code is a good example of that. And then they need to be connected to action profiles for create invoice and job profile uh, with one action, which is to create invoice. There's no invoice level matching involved because you're always gonna get the complete at a fact invoice in one file. So you don't have to um, uh, hook it up um, the way that you might with mark invoicing. And this also takes care of a bunch of the work that's needed to power the mark invoicing which is gonna be our next feature in Juniper. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, hand it over to Ruslan to show the, um, the importing. And we're also doing it on our rancher environment. There's a, a bunch of acquisitions uh, data that you have to get in place to actually import the invoices and make links. You need vendors and funds and orders and acquisitions units. And so um, we didn't uh, we didn't want to try to reconstruct all of that on the shared environment. Uh, thank you, Mary. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Uh, let me know when you can see it. Not yet. Oh, here it comes. We got it. Uh, so, um, uh, today I'm going to demonstrate uh, a de facto invoice uh, import uh, for demonstration purpose. I will use uh, the following de facto uh, file. Um, this uh, file has uh, one invoice and uh, three invoice lines within. Uh, every invoice line uh, is represented in a de facto file by a segments group, which uh, starts with a uh, lean segment. Also, I'm going to use this mapping profile uh, for a de facto processing. This mapping profile um, was made uh, on basis of the default mapping profile for uh, EBSCO vendor, just a little bit expanded. Uh, I filled in vendor name and payment method. Also, for the edifact uh, mapping, uh, we have uh, another syntax, uh, unlike uh, mark uh, uh, mapping syntax for mark record, uh, since edifact uh, records uh, has have different structure. Uh, briefly, it means that. Um, a vendor and invoice number uh, should come from uh, BGM plus a 380 segment from incoming record. Also, uh, currency should be taken from a CUX uh, plus two segment uh, 
log total amount uh, should be taken from OA plus nine segment. And for the uh, invoice lines mapping, uh, I would like to stop on this uh, mapping syntax uh, where this part uh, means that uh, invoice line description uh, should be uh, taken from uh, related uh, from the title of the related pair line and uh, if the related pair line was not found the data from the uh, IMD segment should be used to populate invoice line description and uh, related uh, pair line um, is searched uh, by uh, pair line number, which according to the following mapping syntax, uh, can be obtained from uh, RFF plus Lee segment. And if such map, uh, if such uh, pair line does not exist, um, uh, it will be searched by uh, a vendor reference number from RFF plus SNA segment. And also, uh, he has indicated that um, uh, the data uh, of uh, fund distribution from related power line should be used to populate uh, invoice line fund distributions. So uh, let's import uh, our previously described edifact file. Um, like uh, importing mark uh, record, we choose file to upload. And then we select uh, corresponding job profile for further processing. I, I will choose this one. take some time. And as you can see, our file was uh, successfully imported and processed. Uh, so uh, the new invoice should be created. So let's check it. We can uh, find newly created invoice by uh, vendor invoice number from BGM segment as it was uh, specified at the mapping profile. So let's go to invoice application. Uh, yeah, and here it is. As you can see, the newly created invoice has uh, three invoice lines. and also invoice date uh, to October 2019, uh, which uh, came from the uh, appropriate DTM plus 137 segment, uh, log total amount, which uh, was taken from uh, uh, more nine segment. And uh, uh, so here we have a vendor invoice number, which we already saw at the BGM segment, and vendor name, uh, which was specified as the default uh, value using uh, plugin. Uh, so we can see that uh, according to our mapping profile, for the first and second invoice lines, the description was uh, were taken was taken from uh, uh, title of the related pair lines uh, correspondingly, and for the third uh, invoice lines, uh, any uh, pair line uh, was not matched, was not found. Also. Uh, created invoice lines, uh, have a uh, field uh, fund distribution from the related pair line according to our memory profile. So let's check it. 
uh, in invoice line we have on distributions with found X success and continuation uh, and uh, related per line uh, has the same and uh, second invoice line uh, has uh, ebook and continuation fund distributions so let's check it here yeah so i believe that's it from my side thank you for attention thanks ruslan um and we we still have one little piece left um to finish up some of the log stuff which again we had to rebuild because of um, the edifact structure being different from the mark structure but um, it's all coming together all right that's it for us good to use that this here um I, we're gonna have a little change in the schedule um because uh developer has to leave but can we go next with the erm group hi thanks very much for that i do appreciate it um just share my screen. Hi, can you see my screen? Yep. 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 Looks good. Great. Thanks. So, um, Ethan and I are going to show you a very small piece of work that we've completed recently in the ERM team, uh, which is to hide empty accordions. Um, uh, so. This example here, as you can see, has quite um, quite a few accordions um, and agreements and licenses. Both apps um, ha have the same sort of um, uh, pattern, uh, as do many apps in Folio. Um, so our, our user organizations all work in very different ways. They have uh, different workflows and processes. Um, some libraries have told us they will never use future licenses or historical licenses, uh, but the way it's implemented uh, or was implemented, um, you know, all organizations see the same set of accordions. So um, quite often the accordions were empty. Um, let me just switch over to this. Um, this agreement, which has a minimum amount of information entered. Um, as you can see, we've only got two accordions now. Um, agreement lines and notes are the exception to the rule because both of them have got controls. So add agreement line and the note controls here. So it's not possible to hide, uh, hide these when empty. Um, if we just go and do a quick edit, so add um, internal contact as an example. Um, the accordion shows up there. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I'll hand over to Ethan. He'll give you a bit of um, an overview of how it's achieved te technically. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jill. Uh, this is uh, this is going to be quite short. Um, uh, originally, we had uh, we had wondered if it was possible to do this in a really nice sort of generalizable way um, by having some sort of higher order component that might look at children, see if they're um, see if they're going to render anything, and then either render them or not. Turns out that's not possible, um, which I probably should have seen coming, but didn't. Uh, and then we, we played around with the idea of a higher order component that would take in an array, check its length and render. But it ended up being the case that the easiest and most sort of sane approach was, was just to have a control in the parent component for each of these. So the, the basic React um, pattern of data.length and and component. Um, so that, that's what we do. Um, it allows us flexibility for doing this for some of them, not for others. Um, if we need to uh, render some part of the component, but not others, we can just move that logic 
um, down a level into the uh, the child. So it, it's a very simple pattern, but uh, that's that's what we've done. Good. I, it looks like there's not as much, which is great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And that moves us on to, uh, sorry, everybody, Prokopovich. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Prokopovich. <laughs> Hi, Did guys. I get it right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Yep. Yes, great. I'm gonna tell you about some features that have been implemented in the inventory application. Uh, it was added a group of permissions related to new item statuses. Uh, these permissions work in a similar way. And let's check one of them. I take the newly created user and give him all, all permissions. Uh, all permissions, except, uh, oops, sorry, Russian. Except, uh, let's say, uh, mark item in progress non requestable. It, uh, it presence or absence it easy to notice by its uh, rather long name. Save and after save and close. Oh, here you are. Oh, I'm really happy when I see permissions added instantly, right? And uh, when we log in with this user and select any item, any available item, for example. Sample this one. And, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Let's, let's repeat. User to user. Let's check his permission again. All permission and unknown, for example. And log out, log in as a user, and let's go to the inventory item. Um, yes, available. This one. Oh my God. It, it worked recently, just recently. I don't know what, what happened just right now. Okay, let me, uh, let me check after the meeting, after, and uh, maybe it will be the time to show. Uh, I, I, will go, I will show you another, <clears throat> another small change in the inventory application. It, but just to clarify, it should have been grayed out or not there? You know what should have happened. Uh, should not have been there. If you don't have uh, yeah, mark mark unknown. We 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 can't uh, we can't uh, we can't uh, see this uh, option here because okay, so the user be doesn't have the yeah yeah it doesn't have the uh, corresponding permission. But uh, 
Okay. Something nice. happens wrong. Okay, and another uh, small change is uh, it's uh, mm, a new element was added to the item record page. It's a shelving order element uh, above the item call number fields here. And uh, next uh, improving uh, was here in the instance record uh, item list for holdings. And uh, it was improved sorting of items in the enumeration in the volume and in the copy number fields of, the, of this item list. And uh, before, I'm gonna show you how it works in the volume field. Before I, I sort, I sort these records. And before that, the item in this field were sorted as strings. And now you can see that uh, they are sorting as numbers. Uh, if uh, sorting were done by strings, the order would be uh, something like V1, then V11, and then V2. And now you can see their records sorted by numeric values instead of strings. And uh, the next feature, uh, I'd like to show you today is also here in the inventory. And uh, uh, let's go to the instance reset all. And uh, now we have the ability to search uh, for instance, not only by its uh, resource title, but also by alternative titles, index title, and series titles. In the instance segment, in the title all option, I can enter uh, part of some alternative, alternative title. And you can see the we found an instance uh, by alternative title uh, here. And the same with index, for example. Uh, yes, index, we found the instance that matches uh, the term in the search field. And additionally, I do want to mention that uh, there are a couple more stories in the scope of I new item statuses, but uh, they required required a little work out quite recently, and they will be they will be demoed next time. That's it from me. If you have any questions, please ask. Good. Good to see this stuff coming along. Next we have, and last but not least, we have Falcon. Magda's here. Yes, I'm here. We will have uh, Bogdan and uh, Dmitro uh, presenting the backend and front end work that we have done in the last two sprints. Uh, Bogdan, are you ready? Yes, let me share my screen. Okay, could you see Postman? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so um, today I'm going to show you a couple of new features that we have implemented recently. Um, the first one is uh, a re-index process. And then I will show you um, couple of uh, new search queries that we have implemented. So let's start with uh, re-index. Um, actually, in terms of mod search, re-index means uh, synchronization uh, of state between Postgres and Elasticsearch. Um, this process is useful when, uh, for example, there is a 
uh, some some breaking changes in uh, Elasticsearch uh, index uh, structure when when some properties changed or some some analyzers changed or when uh, we are going to um, we are going to send send um, existing database to to make it searchable. So here we have. Um, a flow chart of the entire process. Uh, actually, it is, um, I would say, uh, consists of two parts. The first part is uh, in mode inventory storage and uh, the rest is in mode search. Uh, in uh, um, mode inventory storage, we, has, um, we have, um, I would say, a system API that allow us to stream instance IDs from um, Postgre database to uh, to Kafka topic, and then e, uh, mod search consumes these uh, events, and um, uh, uh, and call mod inventory storage in order to fetch latest state of of the instance with the, with the ID and uh, with the items and holdings. Um, yeah, and then um, the, this response is interpreted in, in some another structure that is sent to Elastic. Um, actually, the most con con uh, time consuming parts uh, are scalable. Um, so you can easily um, speed up the process by deploying a few more instances of mod search or mod inventory and so on. Um, let's try it. So on Bugfest, oh, sorry, I mean on, on Falcon, Rancher uh, environment, uh, I have created um, um, a tenant. Um, and uh, for this tenant, um, actually, uh, um, we have nothing in um, uh, in uh, mod search index, in elastic search index. And, um, but in uh, mod inventory storage, we have like 29 instances. And, uh, Mm. Uh, the goal is to get these um, instances in the mod search index. For this, we have this uh, separate uh, API endpoint um, that is search index re index. Um, let's, let's call it. So, yeah, here we have response that job, job has been submitted and it is now uh, executed. Uh, in background, but since the, the data set is small, we should, yeah, we should have these uh, instances indexed very, very quickly. So here we have all the instances. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Bless you. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, now I'm going to show you just a uh, few more um, queries, but first let me just switch to our regular um, tenant. Okay. Um, the first query is about searching by um, by item barcode. Um, so here I'm going to search by exact match. So here we have item embedded into instance uh, with this barcode. And it is also possible to search by uh, this wildcard. Yeah, so we are looking for um, item with this um, ID prefix. And here it is. Okay, next query is about ISB and ISSN search. Um, so this query is going to search by uh, exact match. So here we have this failure. 
but uh, we also apply some normalization to ISBN values and it is possible to search for something like like this oops sorry one more try Yeah, like this. So here we have this hyphen and um, and the space, but this original value should not have, yeah, should not have this these characters, and it is additionally has this um, text. Um, okay, next is ISSN search. The same scene, but for ISSN, we don't uh, we don't normalize normalize values these per requirements. Um, yeah, so okay, this, but it is still loved to use uh, wildfire character. Example like this. Actually, the same, the same value, but. Um, so hyphen is uh, uh, matched by this wildcard. Okay, next query is um, about public nodes. Actually, there is no such property uh, on instance. Uh, this, I would say, uh, a virtual um, index uh, that stores uh, nodes that is not uh, stuff, uh, stuff only. Um, yeah, so this this is basically a full text index. Um, okay, next to where next is um, discovery suppress search. Um, yeah, so there is only one um, suppressed instance, but we also can specify false. And there is most of the instances are uh, not suppressed. And the same query, but for stuff suppress, um, there is two stuff suppressed in, uh, instances. Um, then we have um, we we are able to search by language. So, we can, for example, we are looking for. Um, instances with language English, but we also can, for example, search for French. Yeah. And next query is um, search by tag. Um, so we're going to search uh, for instances that has this uh, tag demo. As there is only two such instances. Um, and the last query is um, George by Thor's. So currently um, in follow, we, we have uh, only two types, two, two constants for this uh, related this folio um, and uh, mark and uh, instances with source mark. Uh, no, most of the instances has this source. Yeah, actually, that's it what I have. I think Dimitro will proceed with UI stories. Thank you. We have more demos because we, we need to get to Anton for the last few minutes. Sorry. Is there more? So we uh, have uh, let me share my screen. Um, is everybody going to be able to stay a, a, stay a few minutes late so Anton or can present? Or is this, how long do you think this is going to take? I think 10 minutes maximum. Uh, Dmitry, can you just show a couple of examples uh, so we can have time for um, Anton for his part as well? Thanks. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to show you uh, how advanced search works. Uh, we have uh, two, uh, two options uh, for, um, for performing uh, the search query. Uh, first, uh, uh, we need to, uh, we can type uh, any, uh, any search term, for example, post. And uh, in this case, uh, the search uh, is executed by keyword title contribute identifier. And the second option uh, is, uh, is to use uh, uh, a structure that contains a search option, uh, uh, an operator, a search term, and a Boolean operator, for example. Um, uh, we can type a search option or select it from the list. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, when we type uh, uh, options uh, are highlighted and filtered, uh, uh, when uh, any search uh, uh, element uh, contains two or more words, uh, it is quoted, uh, uh, then we have to type uh, uh, the option. Uh, and if we type not one of the suggested and confirm it, the validation message appears. And then we, we should type a uh, uh, search term. And uh, here we can continue to type uh, optional Boolean operator or uh, make request, I make request. Uh, as we can see, we have uh, uh, results uh, and uh, we can continue to type uh, optional Boolean operator uh, and uh, the structure. And uh, here we can see Los Angeles and, uh, uh, and Boston. Mm. Also, uh, round brackets uh, so are supported. Uh, and uh, I, I, can sh I want to uh, write this expression shortly. Uh, here we can see 223 records. Uh, and uh, the same number of records will be after. Extras. Can go. I get here right now? Go, 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 go. Okay. Don't even change. And uh, here we can see uh, the same uh, number of records. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, we have option with uh, uh, another option with round brackets, for example. And uh, here we can see uh, 224 records. Uh, one record has been added, uh, and it is our instance HRID. And uh, I want to add that we can uh, confirm uh, any uh, search uh, um, element uh, by pressing or enter or space button. And besides, uh, uh, for the search term, uh, uh, it, it, it is uh, uh, confirmed uh, by uh, uh, pressing on only uh, enter button. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so Good much. Question. How big is the database? How big is the database you're searching? Because this is pretty fast. Uh, we had uh, several hundred uh, several hun several hundred records. I know it was updated recently. What is the uh, the current number? It is about uh, fifty thousand, I believe. But it is like we for now we don't uh, we cannot show the performance because it is not the actual uh, setup in terms of hardware. Uh, oh, if okay. it is um, more data, we need more um, powerful hardware. Okay. Very cool. Very fast, though. Thank you, Anton. Yeah. Yes, uh, let me share my screen. Um, uh, who is ever sharing has to unshare? Yes. Sorry, uh, let's see, Dimitri or 
There you go. Thanks. Uh, I promise I'll be very fast. Uh, so, couple announcements. I hope you can see my screen okay. So, first one, we switched uh, reports uh, from Bugfest to, uh, from Big Test to RTL Jest. So if you go to Sonar Cloud and it's specifically for, well, mostly for UI developers because it affects them. So uh, numbers that you see there now, they from uh, RTL Jest coverage reports, not from Big Test coverage reports. So, and general reminder to all teams that you have till September 30th to rebuild all your uh, all your uh, old tests into RTL Jest. So uh, right now all the coverage is exposed in the Sonar Cloud. So uh, please plan accordingly. You still have plenty of time to do it, but um, but um, at this point uh, the coverage is visible. Uh, Next announcement is about API integration test implementation. Uh, tech leads team reviewed and approved guidelines uh, for API integration test implementation. So you could see link to the uh, uh, decision log page here. So you can go and read it in full. So I can quickly uh, gonna, co uh, gonna cover this um, uh, this item. So uh, the goal for API integration test is to have automated regression of the backend on deployed environment, where we can test cross-module interaction, validate producer-consumer relationship, test module permissions, and uh, run tests without mock objects. So it's purely on the deployed environment. We had a goal of 35% cases, test cases implemented in R1 and we're not gonna make it, but I encourage you to start uh, planning and uh, implementing those tests and I'll cover how to do it on the next slide for the R2 and R3 releases. So how to do the scope for this. So it's mostly concerned backend developers and I hope most of you are here now so. This is why I'm addressing it right now. So how to define the scope. So you have to review your interfaces for most important business uh, workflows. So like we always say, don't boil the ocean, just uh, figure out with the product owner, the most important business flows and implement tests for those flows. If you run into a bug after you implement those tests, then you'll have to create uh, another integration test to cover that bug condition. And by all means, you don't need to write tests for all possible conditions uh, at the moment. Now, uh, going forward, for all the new features that you're working on, Again, you need to create those tests. So uh, it must be added to your definition of done and you should not skip uh, those tests uh, as it was done before, but we didn't have guidelines before. So the guideline, you need to have those tests included into your complete feature. For the uh, tests, uh, for the uh, features that already been uh, implemented for a long time. So uh, we're asking all teams before the R1 uh, release ends to uh, have your meetings, identify important business workflows. And uh, so kind of create a test plan for those workflows and estimate them. So create Jira tickets, matching Jira tickets and estimate for those Jira tickets. Uh, so, but that's for the uh, existing interfaces, not the one that you will be working on. So, and this is action items for the teams. Uh, so um, you have to change your definition of done to make API integration test as a required item in your checklist. So all the, uh, so you have to adjust estimates for your are two features that they would include 
those tests and features should not be considered done if you don't have those tests. And again, for uh, R1 is create test plans, meaning review your interfaces and identify uh, important business workflows and uh, um, estimate work is needed to implement a test for those workflows. So that's, uh, that's the ask for the R1, uh, R1. So no code is needed, but planning is. So that's all I have for the time being. Are there any questions? He understands everything, Anton. Well, I think I was uh, just concise and so clear that there's no questions. <laughs> exactly. Everybody's hard at work on it already. Yes. Yes. I'm looking uh, forward. Just, looking forward. Okay. Just to wrap up, then we've got. I did. Um, Maga wanted me to announce that we're hoping to do some more demo next time on the Elasticsearch uh, POC. Um, so that'll be exciting. We're looking forward to that. And also we're going to, we're going to try this, the transcript function for, um, that's available in zoom. And what's really cool is it actually creates a transcript so that people can read through it and scan. And, um, it does also includes the timestamps. So if somebody wants to review a particular section of the, of the review, they can get to it really quick unless there are any objections to anybody. If anybody has any objections on the transcript function, let me know. Uh, but other than that, we hope to use it next time. <laughs> other than that, thank you all and uh, go out and develop. Thanks. <laughs>